Yeah. That's scary. All right. Well, I think we're ready to go. Make sure my PowerPoint doesn't break. So thank you all for coming today to sit down on this nice presentation. Pete will be the moderator and I'll let him do his little moderating duties and then uh, tell you what he's gonna do. And then we'll get going on the uh, presentation. Pete? So um, if you guys have questions, ideally type them into the meeting chat um, or there's a way down low to uh, put an icon up to raise your hand and I'll interrupt uh, Ben when we think, when it's kind of the appropriate spot. So Ben can focus on telling you great stuff. Um, and we'll try to stop along the way uh, for people to ask questions and stuff. So um, that's that's what I'm trying to do. Thank you. You're welcome. So if no one has questions before we get going, we'll uh, we'll start in. And there will be some question portions here. Like I said, if I ask a question, you can either type it in or uh, raise your hand there and Pete can pick on you, or you can just kind of speak up as, as needed. But um, the best way is to type an answer into the chat and he can call on you. And if you haven't already, if you can mute in between and then unmute when you want to talk so we don't have a whole bunch of background noise. And we are recording this so we can uh, save it and post it later for for more views. So with that, we're gonna talk about uh, using ClearNav for success, but mostly uh, the general philosophy of using flight computers and your variometer and what information we really need in the cockpit and how to, how to interpret that. And I'll give you a lot of kind of my takes and what I've learned over the last few years of uh, coaching and flying at contests and just being at contests, seeing what people have and what people use and what works and what seems to not. So, this here is a little uh, ClearNav advertisement put together by our own Eric Thompson. And if that hasn't made you want to buy a flight computer yet, um, so some of the discussion points, what we're going to talk about tonight, uh, we're going to go over the uh, general setup and philosophy of your flight computer and kind of what philosophy you want to use when you're going through the setup, knowing the information you want. We're going to start by focusing on the flight computer. Uh, there'll be a big emphasis on the clear nav. That's what I fly. That's what we sell. That's what I use. Um, but a lot of the theory going into it will apply to UDI, LXNav, and some of the others for the general setup philosophy. Uh, not so much the user interface pieces, um, but what does my point of view do to me? Uh, what's what are fun features that they have compared to what do we actually need? What information are we pulling from the cockpit? And then going over the uh, ClearNav Vario, uh, just deciphering the information that's on the screen, and then talking a little bit about the thermal assist and how to best use it um, to your advantage. So starting with our flight computer setup. Um, you know, first off, why do we use flight computers at all? Um, this kind of goes out to the group, but what's the computer doing for us? What are we trying to get out of it? I'm trying to get to the term points. 
Absolutely. And knowing our distances, you know, some, some people here maybe started in the paper map days and turn point cameras. Um, you know, now everything has computers in it. Um, and they give us a lot of really good information, but there's also just some noise and, and extra features that are in there. So what do we need our computer to tell us? What are we using it for? So, you know, when we're talking about our computer, is it, are we using it to figure out how far we need to go to the next turn point? Are we flying tasks with it or are we just fun flying and, and gathering the information? Um, how quickly can we decipher how far we are from a turn point, whether it be for position reporting or getting to the next turn point so we can get in and out? Um, what are our glides back to our distant, uh, our destinations, getting back to the airport, getting back to a known land out field? How do we pull that information out of the computer? And it all starts with how do we set up our computer? So how many people run, uh, you know, when you're thinking about your computer setup, what, what am I using the computer for? Am I using it to have safety glides in flight? Am I using it to make it use my computer so I'm always getting back to a safe, out, uh, safe altitude over my return destination, be it the home airport or a land out field? Or do I want to use it to actually help me in flight make better tactical decisions? Um, a lot of people use it purely for do I have glide back to the airport, which is fine, but you're really limiting the knowledge you can suck out of your computer when you're flying. So when we're setting up, we'll talk about it, we'll get into the glide amoebas and setup, but when we're setting our computer, we don't wanna dumb down our computer. A lot of people build safety into their computer or think it's better to build safety in their computer. Some I've heard people say, well, my glider's you know, 42 to one, I'm flying the 32, it's 50 to one. So I'm gonna set my computer back at 45 to one so I have a safe glide. You want your computer to have the correct numbers. You want to input the glide puller that's published into the computer so it can do the right thing for you. There's no, there's no benefit in giving myself a 40 to one, 45 to one glide. My computer is not going to tell me the right information the whole time. So you really want to make sure you have the right numbers set up there. Um, you have inputted them in the proper place. You have your correct weight in the plane. Um, all these things, if you don't do it, computers are only good as the information we put into it. So if we put garbage in, we're going to get garbage out. And even though it might seem like safe glides, when you go and you have to stretch a little bit, if your computer isn't set right, you're not going to know whether you can stretch it or not. Or you're just going to go, well, I know I have uh, my computer cycled back a little bit, so I'm going to stretch out past what it says. And then it's useless information anyway in the cockpit. Um, oh, is it Rex? The other big question we are setting up is when we're looking at the computer is I, I've played around with this a lot over the years, but there's a lot of features you can turn on and turn off with ClearNav. There's a lot of different tasking options. Uh, I know with LX, there's a bunch of different screens you can set up, UDI, everything. You really have to ask yourself, what do I need in the cockpit? What data do I need and what extras do I want? Um, and sometimes this takes you a season or two to go turn, turn some data on, turn it off. I used to fly with every feature turned on and think I needed to know my time from start, my, uh, last hour, my flight average climb. There's some data that you can put on the cock in the, on the screen that you just never look at and it's not useful. Um, so really kind of going through each at the beginning, of each season, look back at your computer and say, Hey, how many times did I actually look at that screen? Was it worthwhile or is it just noise? Um, or if it is an extra screen, is it buried far enough back where I don't need to look at it all the time that I can pull it up the one or two times I might actually use it? Um, I texting me that she took feet on the floor and she's stuck in. Someone's got a TV going on. Please mute. So, 
You got it? There we go. Uh, so your flight computer uh, versus your variometer. So when we're talking about, you know, uh, what information do we need to know? Where are we getting that information from? So when it comes to glide back home, do I need to do I need that pulled up on my computer all the time? Um, you know, with the ClearNav, you have the amoebas. So do you really have your home airport set? As soon as you're off tow, the home airport should be in your rear view mirror. You're not worried about it until you come home. You want to periodically check, make sure you have good glide. You may be on low scratchy days. You might still have it plugged in. But once we're out and going, we need to know that we have our glide. Um, we, we're worried about what's going on ahead of us, not what we have back behind um, as we're taking off on course. Where do I get that information from? So if I have my final glide to Williams set on the Vario, then my flight computer should just be helping me make in-flight tactical decisions for the entire flight. I don't need to periodically check on home. It might be pulled up on that Vario screen. Uh, if I'm wondering where my my land, if I have my next uh, available land out made, I've punched that in the various, so I'm not using the flight computer and having to ma manipulate the flight computer to answer those questions. This should just be helping me make tactical decisions in the cockpit. So that computer's primary job is, you know, knowing what the distance out ahead of me is that I need to get to. Maybe um, you have the, uh, you're trying to look out and compare where the end of the cloud street is to where the next turn point is. How much altitude do I need to, to get comfortably into that turn point, plus made it get back out to my safety return? Can I clear that mountain range? Uh, we should be able to see that outside, but our clear nav uh, or our flight computer can give us some of that information too to go, hey, are we gonna clear it by a lot? Are we gonna clear it by a little? Um, and that also comes back into what have you set as your as your margins in your computer? My variometer, what's its primary job, right? Should be telling me my average climb, um, probably giving me some. What did I do? <laughs> That's cool. Anyway, uh, I don't know what I, how I scribbled on that. Um, what's the primary job? So. Uh, what's my what's my average climb? What's my climb rate? What's my netto and my cruise? Maybe what's my speed to fly doing? It'll give you better speed to fly information than your flight computer. Um, but how's it set up and what information am I pulling out of it? Because at the end of the day, um, you know, how much time should you be spending in the cockpit on average? I know, I know. How long? 10 seconds at most. 10 seconds at most, right? You know, yep. maybe 10 seconds per minute in the cockpit. Um, so what's that data I need? Where is it located? How do I glance at it and pull it back out? So it really takes knowing that computer, knowing where it is and knowing what that information it's telling me so I don't have to fudge around in the back of the cockpit. Um, fortunately with the flight experience I have, I do mostly two place flying. So I spend a lot of time with my head in the cockpit, playing around with the computer. I did uh, the 20 meter two place in Montague. And that's all I was doing was playing with the computer for Dennis on days where he was flying. So, um, you know, trying to figure out how you can play with the computer and how to quickly get to the screen you need to and get back off without spending any head down time. Um, so let's see here. I got a couple of comments, Ben, just a second. Mm -hmm. Somebody apologize for making all that noise. Thank you. Um, yep, that's it. That's the only comments that really matter right now. All right. Um, and then knowing what other things my computer can do for me. So what other features does the Vario have that might be interesting information that I can get to? Um, like I said, some of those things that are more neat information. For example, the variometer will give me outside air temperature. You know, when I'm cruising along and uh, in the wave and I'm freezing, I wanna know how cold it is. Yeah, I can cycle over to it, but how long do I know how to get to it quick enough that it's worthwhile snaking over to that screen so I can still keep that 10 seconds per minute in the cockpit. If I have to look down to make an adjustment, it's not gonna be worthwhile. Um, 
do I know how to, when we're flying contests, it's not uncommon to get a, uh, a new task change in the air. How quickly can I input a task and do I know how to quickly change and manipulate a task so I can do so safely and fly the glider, keep the adequate amount of uh, heads up time to make sure we have uh, safe clearances, we're not around anyone and get my computer set properly. All very important, so it's key to be proficient in moving, setting tasks if you're flying in that kind of environment. Um, but even with the VSA series we're doing here, you fly two or three tasks, you might have to change that, set it in there. And it's really easy, I've done it, where you get clicking on buttons and you're looking at the screen and next thing you know, you're, you, you know, two, three miles have gone by and you haven't really, you've been looking outside, but you're not really flying and navigating. You sit there clicking buttons and it's really easy to get sucked into. So um, knowing the computer that you're using is key. But with that, we'll jump into actually some of the features of the clear now and some of the setup. So we're gonna talk about the Glide Amoeba. We're gonna talk about some of the task optimization tools and what they're telling us. We're gonna talk about some farm targeting and uh, some things that have changed with that and going to change. And then uh, final glide and task information. Stand by one, Ben. Oh, yeah. and November 9 has a comment. It says 10 seconds is a long time, 60 miles an hour, 80 feet a second, 10 seconds is 800 feet traveled. And yeah, I mean, if you can do it less, um, November 9, that'd be better. 10 seconds came from when I was flying with Brian Spreckley, one of the USK, one of the UK coaches. And he said, no more than 10 seconds. Um, and it, you, when you try to do that, it actually, makes a huge difference on spending the time outside. So if you do it less, that's great. But if you kind of do the scan through the cockpit, it's somewhere between eight to 10 seconds, or if you decide to stop and tweak something. So it's a good point, 880 feet at 60 miles an hour. So, you, you know, all the real knowledge is outside. You're, you know, you're, all your instruments are just telling you what's going on, not what to do. That's it, Ben. No, absolutely. That is, uh... Very key. So here's a bit of a question, for everybody. So um, we're going to start out by talking, what do we set? So I've flown for years and years um, with the ClearNav, with Glide Navigator, with all the other tools we've had in the cockpit in the last 18 years I've flown, or 15. Um, you know, everyone talks about setting safety margins. What's my safety margin? What's that set to to my destination? But I think first we have to understand what is that safety margin we're setting? What is it talking about? So with the clear nav specifically, when I come in and I'm using my final glide settings, down here, and I set my arrival height, is that just back to the airport? No, that is my arrival height for anything I select. So if I select Goat Mountain and I have 1500 feet set in there, the computer is, uh, I've told the computer that I wanna arrive 1500 feet above that turn point, whatever it might be, whether it be a land point, an outfield landing, a turn point on top of the mountain, a turn point in the valley, it's 1500 feet. So am I, going to be unhappy if I arrive under 1500 over goat no you can be two three four hundred feet over goat and still be in a safe spot ideally 500 or better is going to feel a lot nicer but I don't want my arrival to be zero or I don't want my arrival to be 1500 then the whole time I'm flying I'm going to have to do backwards math and go okay I'm going to go up to Black Butte it says I'm gonna arrive 500 feet low. That means I'm gonna be a thousand feet above the mountain. That took way too much brain power to figure out as I'm in glide and trying to think about three or four other things. When you're trying to go, hey, am I gonna arrive there at an okay spot? You've probably know that, hopefully you know it by looking out the cockpit and going, hey, I'm not gonna hit the top of that mountain either, um, which is the ideal place to be is out of the cockpit. But you don't wanna spend unnecessary brain power because you start doing that every, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you're changing a task. On uh, the course of five hours, you've wasted a lot of brain energy there, um, burning calories that you don't need to burn, trying to think about some math. So I set mine to zero. 
I still have a, a safety margin when you come out in the clear nav, you have these light amoebas, which are nice. So my red amoeba is always gonna be my zero, or sorry, my, my purple amoeba is my arrival height. That's gonna be down to zero. And my red one here is gonna be 1500 feet. So if I zoom out on the, on the screen and anything I wanna hit is still within the red, I know I'm gonna be there with at least 1500 feet and not worry about it. Then when I go and I'm gliding home and I punch in Williams, if it says 50, plus 1500 or more, I'm good. I know exactly what altitude I'm gonna arrive back above the field because it's telling me I don't have to worry about math. It, if it says 200 feet low, oh, I can ignore it. Even though it says I'm low, I'm still gonna be 1200 feet. Now you're getting in complacent and to the point where you're ignoring the computer and not liking the fact that it says negative. You should neg never say negative if you set it to zero. So um, with that, what other data can I get from this picture here? What is this amoeba showing me? Anybody? They're in awe of your knowledge, Ben. They're timed out. Yeah. Pete, what do you see from this picture? I see a, hang on a second. I see a fine looking, I'm going to get on top of the hill and life's going to be great. Yeah. Um, yeah. David Prather says, train you, you can, I think he means train, you're all clear. Yeah, train, you can clear. Absolutely. So yeah. if I look here, down to the Walker Ridge area, if I'm gliding in, I know that just based on this picture here, I can't get the, the top of goat. I'm going to hit zero feet, just about the little knob before goat south pass. So I can't glide in there hoping to get a thermal, but I can get on top of Walker Ridge. I'm going to be less than 1500, but more than zero because it passes that. And same thing up here in the Indian Ranch area. You know, I'm going to be about 1500 feet as I cross kind of just over the sites gap as I'm pushing up, but 1500 feet is way out there in the valley. So I can kind of start to see that I can clear the mountain, not at 50, I can get there more than zero, less than 1500 if I'm running into that red line. So it helps with what terrain can I clear? Where can I make it? You can see it on final glide. You can see it when you're coming back down to the south. Can I make it over the Sites Ridge or the um, the Sheet Iron Ridge, or I can't quite make it over snow. Um, all those things will kind of come into play when you're just zoomed out looking at your glide amoeba. So, and those are back to those quick glances. What can I get from it? And is it making sense with what I see outside? I should be looking out and saying, yeah, I'm gonna clear that ridge. And at a glance, I can look down at the computer and say, hey, it says I'm gonna clear it too. Anybody got any other questions? Anyone? No, no. Looks like we're all good, Ben. Cool. It wasn't nexting. I got it nexted. Yeah. Now. I was trying to help you out there. Thank you. Very helpful. All yeah. right. So the task optimization in the clear nav. Oh, cool. I made a start line. Um, anyway, so now. Another, another neat feature of the ClearNav and some of the other ones is the task optimization and what it's trying to tell me when I'm tasking. So pulled up on the screen here before we start getting into it is a uh, turn area task with two miles around Maxwell, two miles around Antelope and four miles down around Arbuckle. And it's set for about an hour and 50, it's an hour and 15 minute long task. And I've already started, I've cleared the start line and I'm heading up towards Maxwell. So what is the computer telling me? So typically we're used to seeing the line going straight to the middle of the turn point, right? If I just selected Maxwell, it'd take me right in the middle and tell me my distance there. What the clear nav here is telling me is where I need to hit optimally to meet my hour and 15 minute time crunch that I'm looking for at my set McCready value. So here I'm set for McCready two and my speed to fly, which I think is more important than the McCready value is 65 knots. So me personally, when I'm setting McCready, I don't care about what the McCready value is, whether it be two, 1.5, 3.5, whatever I'm setting. What I'm truly setting is my speed I would like to achieve on course. 
So I set this down here for my speed I'm looking for. So in this, this is set for a K21. I was doing this on Condor with the, uh, using the clear nav sim. And I said, I think I can do this at 65 knots. So I can look out and it's saying, if I'm doing 65 knots in an hour and a half, I need to get to the back of pretty much each turn to make it home. And if I turn early, it'll adjust these lines and will put a little ellipse circle of where I need to, what, what area I need to turn to be pretty close to on track for my time. So by looking put pretty quick, zooming out, you go, all right, if I'm gonna hit the back of the first turn, that's only gonna mean I have to go into the middle um, or the back third of the second two turns. And it can help you kind of think about your day and plan out your day of where, if, if you keep on that track, where you're gonna optimize. And you can look at it and go, okay, well, if I'm gonna pick up some speed, I can cut these shorter. I'm going to have to go a little deeper uh, later on. Of course, we're going to make 90% of our decisions looking outside, but this is just going to help either um, confirm your thinking, or if it looks really off, it might just allow you to, it might just trigger you to take a second of pause to go, okay, what's it thinking that I'm not? And if it's not gelling with the computer, take a second and figure out, is it the computer or is my thinking a little bit jacked? So that covers what it's telling me, that covers what is it based on. So it's all based on that speed to fly you've set in there, right? And most people think of it as their McCready value. I really think thinking <laughs> about what you're trying to achieve is a better way of thinking that through. Um, cover how do we use the data? Um, what is the McCready value telling me? Um, any questions on that task optimization and setting McCready? No, they're in awe of your knowledge, Ben. Nobody's got anything to say, it looks like. Anything to add, Pete? Um, no. Okay. Okay, here's a question. Condor integrated into uh, ClearNav. Is it? Can you run ClearNav and Condor? So, no, not really. Um, we, I have the, uh, uh, one of our, our clear nav tech, Vadim, who flies out with us, uh, he was able to, he had to break a, uh, an old clear nav that to get it to, he had to break the IGC to allow me to hook up a clear nav to Condor. Um, so we have a clear nav set up here to run. It'll also be at the SSA convention for a demo, but we have it here set up on our Condor flight simulator at the glider at the at the airport here, so you can use it, and we can do coaching and things like that to kind of work through these skills. But it's not uh, commercially available. Does that answer that? Yeah, that covers it. That's the only question. Cool. The rest of the people are in awe still. Oh, wait a minute. He said thanks. Nice. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right. Uh, Flarm. Flarm is always a hot topic on flight computers. Um, two big questions. One is uh, why the B-52s? Uh, the B-52 is just the, uh, the little flight example, but I think it is important. This is going off the flight computer a little bit, but talking about what is Flarm giving us compared to ADS-B and there's a lot of conversation back and forth about where someone is, what the farm target they're seeing, and that they can't see them outside. And it takes up a lot of radio traffic uh, all season long. We hear, I see you on farm. I don't see you on farm. I see you, but you're not on farm. There's always going to be issues. Um, you know, part of the problem is that the, all of our farm targets are only good as our antennas only as good as our configuration setup on our farm. Some people just don't have great antennas. We don't like to hang things out of our very expensive fancy gliders. You know, sometimes the shark fin out of the bottom on a farm receiver works a little bit better, but that means we got to install it. We got to pay someone to drill a hole in the bottom of the glider. And now we hang this antenna out that we bang on the trailer, break off. It just, it's not ideal. Um, so a lot of people have ADSB out now. Um, and ADSB is going to show up as a B-52 currently um, as soon as they're out of farm range. 
So when you when you ask the question, why do I see a B-52 instead of a glider? We have, I have it working. Uh, we have it in beta right now. And I'm waiting on a couple more guys to fly it and get a couple more, um, a couple of good, good long flights on it before we release the new uh, ClearNav software that does it. But we've changed a few things with the uh, how Flarm is displayed, and that ADSB is now filtering through the FlarmNet file. So you'll remain if you get out of Flarm range, they won't turn into a B52. They will stay with the call sign. You just won't have all the Flarm information associated with it. So. The FLARM information, you know you're getting a FLARM target because it's going to tell you um, it's higher or lower. It's going to give you an altitude and whether they're climbing or descending. Um, if it's just ADSB traffic, it'll just give you the B-52 and their altitude. Same thing would be true. So if someone's out here and they're out of FLARM range, but in ADSB range and it's a glider and they are registered on FLARMnet, it'll remain their call sign with their altitude. Um, it'll display as blue. If it's above us, green if it's below us, and red if they're within 500 feet. So I'm going to play this little video and watch it come in and out of view. So I'm circling here with, uh, I think, Pablo and Bravo Mike. But in the 32, my antennas are up in the front. So as soon as he gets at my tail, that antenna signal isn't going through all the carbon in the glider, so I'm losing him when he's behind me. So it's important for me to know what are my blind spots for the for the farm. It's not foolproof, right? Um, I told Pete earlier, but Pete, what is a uh, what is farm used for? What is farm used for? To see your friends and hopefully won't hit you. Oh, do you remember what I called it earlier? Uh, no, sorry, dude. That was way too uh, morning. Flarm in our computer is purely a uh, situational analysis enhancer, right? I'm it's just sorry. trying to enhance our situational <laughs> awareness. Situational awareness enhancer, sorry. Yeah, I remember now. Yeah, it should help us know where people are. Uh, it's better than what we had before, but it's not foolproof. Nothing is ever going to take the place of keeping your head out of the cockpit. Um, you know, it's it's good technology, it helps, but we do need to know um, what our limits are, what our range is in our, our unit, but there's a lot of times where we're just not gonna see them on farm because we're at their tail, they're at our tail, our tail's facing them, it's gonna come in and out. So the best thing you can do is get used to see, you know, real quick, I, if I'm looking at this picture, I know, that it's red, he's within 1500 feet. I can see based on my box, he's two miles out. So I'm gonna look plus or minus uh, 500 feet and about two miles out and try and find him outside. And it shouldn't take a Bravo Mike, I have you on farm. He should have you on farm too. If he's coming at me, maybe that needs a radio call. But if he's two miles out and he's circling too, I'm just gonna look for him. If you find him, great. But, um, you know, unless it seems like he's coming right at me and it's going to cause a conflict, there's not really a need for a radio call. Um, unless you're trying to figure out if he's climbing better and you're going to go work your way towards him, you know, all the extra is just wasted time on the radio uh, that may, you're, you're clogging up the radio for something that might be more important. And the more we chatter and I get into it, I get chattering, but the more we chatter, the less time there is for someone else to make a really important radio call if two people are about to come in contact and need to get a quick radio out and we're jabbing on about nonsense, it's it's really hindering the safety of all other pilots out there. So that's my farm soapbox and I'll get off of it. Nice soapbox, Ben. Uh, All right, so that's pretty much what I got for the flight computer portion of this. We're going to move on to the Vario. Does anyone have any flight computer questions? Anything else they like answered about the ClearNav or flight computers in general? Not so far. So Jeev Singh says, thanks a lot, Pete and Ben, uh, for organizing it. He had to drop off. Otherwise, right. that's the last comment. 
All right, well, then we'll move on and talk about the new variometer, newish variometer. So, oh, um, piece, I'm actually going to drop back one because I want to point this out. But I want to give a shout out real quick to Jim Dark. All of these cool paintings in the background that you see are all Jim Dark original paintings. Some of these are blown up and they don't have the whole thing. But uh, for those that don't know, Jim is uh, taking on a career in, in art and he, I mean, he's always done all our graphic design stuff for our maps and everything, but he made some very beautiful pictures and he allowed me to feature them on the ClearNav stuff and on the ClearNav website and just uh, some really cool artsy pictures. Most are renderings of photos he took while he was flying gliders. So um, we're going to talk about the ClearNav Vario now. Uh, we're going to focus on the flight screen and the cruise screen, um, the, the new ribbon, the navigation, and then finish off by talking about thermal assist. So what we're looking at here is the new 57 millimeter uh, round color display uh, that was released, uh, kind of soft released about two years ago, three years ago. Um, but most people, we have about a hundred or two, uh, hundred or so out in the glider community now, and uh, we just finished building another 80 of them, I think. Uh, so hopefully we'll start seeing these in more gliders. But we'll talk about some of the legacy displays that we had. So a lot of people, ClearNav Vario started out, it had the analog display, uh, was the analog pointer. It gave you your top and bottom climb. You can put your McCready in it, and it had a uh, either a cross country or a club license. Now, uh, then we moved out and we got the square display um, with the five buttons in the bottom. It wasn't the prettiest thing in the panel, but it was a really nice feature. It was the first time we had the thermal assist feature in, and uh, a feature a lot of people don't know about and don't use is the overhead thermal map. So we're going to talk about those things a little bit. So you have uh, the cruise screen and the climb screen we'll go over to start out with. So with ClearNav Vario, in the cruise screen, there's a lot of information going on uh, here just as we're flying in, in normal cruise. Um, we have our destination set. We can set any arrival margin we'd like to in our Vario. So like I said, I set zero on the flight computer um, and for the for the variometer, depending on who I'm flying with, what I'm doing, and all the all of the Williams um, rental fleet, we have 1,500 feet set up as our arrival. But um, when I'm flying contests, I set 1,000 feet for my arrival there. Um, when I'm selecting my alternative fields and things like that, so it helps with the thinking. We have destination. We have speed to fly. So the green is my speed I need to be flying, or it's suggesting I fly that I'm chasing after. Uh, we have our McCready speed and the block we have set for it. So it's got about in this, in the medium setting, it's got uh, four knots plus or minus here. And I'm shooting for 64 knots. My current speed is my white pointer. It's reverse of a normal uh, airspeed indicator, which takes a second to get used to of up being slow and down being fast, but it only takes a flight or two to realize that flips around. We have wind speed and destination. We have numeric punched up and then we have an arrow relative to the glider. The arrow gets bigger, the stronger the wind and where it is. So I know my wind's at my tail. We have our glide average, which is our five second average. And it can be set to relative netto. It can be set to TE or netto. We have our glide slope to destination. So we can see whether we're above or below glide if we can't read the plus or minus numbers. And then we have the distance, uh, our, our, our distance set and our altitude differential to our arrival point on our cruise screen. So, so a lot of information all packed into a tiny instrument. Yes. So Ben, we have a question and um, we have two questions. One is the cross country package versus the club version. I don't know how all that works these days versus the color display software versions and licenses. I mean, is everything, I mean, you know, things used to ship with a cross-country license versus a club license. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how that works these days. So so we, we've done away with the club license. So it used to be that it was an upcharge for the cross-country license. Um, after we took a hold in 2000, 
16 ish. Um, we did away with uh, the club license. So there are still some club licenses out there, but it was really only on that analog display. Uh, if you have a club license, it was an upcharge, but now everything comes with a cross country license. Anything shipped in the last four to six years has came with a uh, cross country license. You can still read about the club license on the website, but um, it's pretty much gone away with it. Just it uh, before the club option did not give you the thermal assist and it didn't give you any of the navigation tools. It was just a variometer. Um, but we've gone, gone away with that. Um, and, and you do need a, I believe you still need an updated software license for the color display. Is that true? Yeah. So if you upgrade from a square display to a, um, a round, uh, to the 57 millimeter round display, you'll get an updated light. You'll get a new license with it. You don't have to pay any extra for the new license. You get a new license and you also get access to the 3.8 software, which is running all the color display. There is 3.8 software, which unlocks the ribbon um, and a few other features on the square display. And that's a hundred dollar upcharge to get the 3.8. And it also cleans up some of the text. Um, so it looks a little nicer on the square display, but really all it's doing is giving you the ribbon option um, instead of having to cycle through with the go button um for the square display upgrade and there's one more question um from mr oh we got two more questions um from dave prather are the speeds to fly indicators and readings compensating for the calculated wind yes they are so it's it's giving you the same speed to fly uh data so it's it's taking in the wind what air master in trying to get you to slow down or speed up um it's putting a little bit of wind calculation in there, but mostly it's dealing with uh, the lift you're in, speeding up or slowing down, but it's not running you to that destination. It's just based on your McCready, whether you should be slowing down or speeding up. Yeah, I don't think it's taking into account the winds until you try to glide somewhere. Yeah. So the speed to fly yeah, is the, the speed to fly. Yeah the, wind, yeah, the wind is going into your distance to destination, your altitude differential. Right, but not into the speed you should be flying now. So it's not giving you, you know, plus half the headwind or anything like that. Yeah. Okay. There's one more question. There's a purple 28 uh, stat SM 28 SM distance to destination, and yes, that is, is correct. Yes, it is. So everything right. uh, it's nice and color coded. So everything purple. So you have purple up here is I'm going to Williams. My purple line off my glider is that's my track to Williams my distance to Williams and my altitude above Williams. My orange is my wind and my wind. Okay, that's all the questions we have on deck right now. Cool. Then we switch over to the climb screen. So this is climb without thermal assist. And so you can, it, it used to be that you had a cruise climb switch in the plane. Uh, you can still do that if you like. Um, I don't, I've never had to fly with a cruise climb. I think it's needed like back east. They use it when you're doing um, ridge soaring, right, Pete? You use the cruise climb a little bit more. Um, it, actually, I use it when um, when there's convergence or wave because the, the vario doesn't always switch. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, switching on the ridge too to, if you want to know what the net is doing. So, so you can you can still have a manual switch to it. There's also a way if you don't have a switch that you can force it in the cruise mode or force it in the climb mode um, on the ribbon option that I'll show you later. But when we're flying here, um, we have it auto. Uh, the little A with the circle is showing it's auto. And so as soon as I start to make a turn about 45 degrees and decelerate, it's going to switch from the cruise mode to the climb mode. Um, it's it's registering that you're getting into a climb. And so it'll go from that. You can have the Vario up the whole time in the cruise if you'd like. There's three options you can choose from there, but I like it in the speed to fly. And then as soon as I start to turn to climb, it switches over into my Vario. As soon as it switches, your destination stays the same. You have two green arrows down here and it'll be more apparent in the next slide. But your big green arrow is my bottom average, which is my top to bottom average. My small green arrow is my last turn average. And the little red indicator there is your McCready value you have set. Then you have your climb rate. 
read normal like a, a variometer would. Uh, like I said, wind speed and direction hasn't changed, altitude differential and distance has not changed. But now you have your last turn average is the top and our last uh, turn time. So how long it took us to make that turn, which is a very valuable piece of information I found uh, uh, I came to learn. I didn't, I never used that until I flew the nationals. Well, I guess it was two years ago with Dennis. And he was telling me that I was circling too wide. And I'm like, how, what do you mean? And uh, he said uh, from, and he got it from Sam Zimmerman. He said, if you're, th if you're not thermal in at 19 seconds, it's too wide, which is not the only metric. Don't only use 19 seconds, but it's a good metric to look down at and look, you know, am I tight enough? What's my rate of turn, which we don't often think about. We always think about angle of bank. Um, but what, how long did it take me to get around that turn? And then I'll have total time. So this and the next slide you'll see, but um, that's going to be my top to bottom climb. So I can look and see that I've been in this thermal for three minutes, five minutes, eight minutes, whatever it's been. And then that average will be based on that total time. So you have top to bottom thermal average, top to bottom thermal time and last turn in our climb screen. So um, another new feature is the ribbon navigation that we're used to seeing with the ClearNav uh, flight computer. You know, normally you click the menu button and you get the ribbon up along the top. So now instead of half in on the square display, you click the go button and you'd have to cycle through some screens. Now you click in the uh, right encoder, which the encoder is the knob down here. You click the knob and you get your menu navigation. Uh, you're gonna navigate uh, left and right along that ribbon and then switch encoders and it'll go up and down. So I can change my speed to fly band. I can change my volume. I have my ballast. I have my bug set up. Um, I also have the selection between my push pull chevrons. The speed to fly is the version we were just seeing and the variometer. Um, we also have features on the ribbon. Um, there's a couple other features, but the big one is you can force it into cruise and force it into climb. So by cycling almost to the end of the ribbon, like when we're flying in the wave, you can cycle that over and force it into climb mode and force it back out when you go into cruise if you don't have that cruise climb switch. So normally that's really the only place I've found where I'm forcing it into climb is in the, um, in the when I'm doing uh, some wave flying, but you can do it that way. You can also do it on the square display by holding down the left arrow, it'll force it into climb mode and force it back out of climb mode. Navigation, so the Vario also does uh, some nice, has some nice navigation features. So there's multiple waypoint option um, that you can select from. So I can go over and I can select airports. I can look by uh, turn point by number, uh, which can be a lot of turn points to go cycle through, um, but it'll give me airports by distance um, when I cycle over to another navigation screen and it'll pull up or I can get my land points by distance. You can also set a task in here and it does have a moving map with the uh, turn points on it. It's not very user friendly. Remember you're looking at a 57 millimeter display. So it's hard, it would be hard to navigate off of, but you could, if that was the only, um, only means of navigation you had, you could do it. And you can pull it up into a independent nav screen uh, to just give you bearing distance to wherever you're trying to go. The most fun feature of the ClearNav uh, Vario, and especially with the new color feature, is the thermal assist. So the thermal assist, ha again, has a lot of information on a single screen here. But our thermal assist is giving us our last turn average, which is going to be my little green arrow associated with the top number here. It's going to give me my top to bottom climb average, which is my green arrow here, so I can quickly decide if my average is dropping below or above. It's gonna give me an adjustment arrow, which is my little white arrow. And in the next slide, it's a little bit longer, but it's pointed to where it thinks the strongest part of the lift is and where you want to adjust. It's gonna show, I have my McCready set in here. It's showing me where I have it. So I'm set at a, like a 0.5 in this picture. And then the advanced ping is this little dotted line. 
So we're going to cycle over and watch a video here in a second, but you'll hear once the arrow lines up, I can set, set that advanced ping to any um, degree I'd like. So for me, I have it set to 10 degrees before my centering arrow, and it'll give a little audible chime. It goes beep, beep and reminds you that, hey, you want to make an adjustment. You don't have to make an adjustment, obviously. You're the one flying the plane. Don't let the variable make you make decisions. But it's just a nice little reminder when you're thinking about three other things, you hear that little chirp and go, oh, yeah, I was going to make an adjustment. And you can look down, make your adjustment, look out, make sure it makes sense, and then center up. And I, this thing, it, I, didn't, I didn't believe it when I first started flying it, but this has helped me uh, center much faster. Again, on the other side, we have our last turn average, our last turn time. So you can see in this thermal, we're circling at 26 seconds. So Sam and Dennis would be mad at me. Um, my thermal assist, it's still an auto, uh, auto switch to climb. Uh, it gives me my time in turn. So we've been circling for three minutes and 23 seconds. And for our entire average, we've been at 3.4. And my last turn average is 6.4. So the, the one bad thing about this is it's going to keep you honest. So you can't go, wow, I had a six knotter. And I hit six knots for a turn, but I really had a 3.4. So there's one question, Ben. The question is, can airport by distance include all land out locations, not just airports? So there are, it depends on your database, how yeah. your turn points are assigned. But there is an airport by distance, which is defined as a true hard service airport or whatever you have defined, uh, defined in your database. Or it can be, there is a separate one for land out. So if your database has distinguished land outs compared to airports, there's two different databases. Oh, 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 oh. Somebody needs to mute. I think that's Randy. Also in there, there's a number of things. So your thermal assist, a lot of it you'll set up in your profile, whether it auto switches and uh, what tones you hear, you can turn on and off the... Um, your sync tones, your lift tone, or your sync tones, your cruising lift tones, your cruising sync tones, depending on how much noise you want to have during your flight. But all your thermal assist can be all set up in your thermal assist setting. So you run over here, you enable thermal assist. That's where you set up how far you want your advance uh, advance notice to be, how um, whether you want to hear the ping whether you want it to switch and return either manually or automatic and how long you want before you switch into thermal assist. So it might be that you don't want thermal assist to come up until you're at 270 degrees, 360. I often have it set to 90 degrees. Looks like when I took this picture, I adjusted it to 270 degrees. So I'm gonna make a 270 degree turn before it brings up that thermal assist picture. And those are all personalized settings uh, that you can do on the clear now. Um, with the thermal assist. So here you can see that this was, uh, these uh, both pictures were taken when Dennis and I were flying at the Nationals. So this is a really good uh, picture of a thermal assist as we got in. We've been circling in this climb for four minutes and 30 seconds. Our last turn was a 30 second turn. Um, but you can see we're only halfway in this thing. Uh, we probably adjusted out after a little bit of time, but you can see it's suggesting a pretty big move off our left wing here. And our advance is almost coming around, so that's set 10 degrees before the turn. So here in the next, you know, five or eight seconds, we should pretty much we should have a pretty aggressive rollout and come back in to really core up on this thing. Is what the the uh, clear nav is suggesting. The other feature in the clear nav that a lot of people don't use, and it's a great feature, and it's maybe a reason to run a second variometer, whether it be the square display or the round display, is the overhead thermal map. Um, so in the video, it'll show switching from the thermal assist to the thermal map, but you can get an overhead depiction of the map, which people are used to who fly uh, like CU Mobile, things like that. Usually you're used to seeing the overhead dots or a lot of people zoom in to the, um, zoom in on the clear nav to see the dots. I used to do that and I stopped doing it. I stopped doing it because once you zoom in on the clear nav, yes, you're focused on the thermal, but now you have two things telling you about your thermal and you lose that situational analysis enhancer that we love to talk about on the radio 
of all my farm targets. So now I'm looking at my screen at 0.2 miles and I'm really closed in. I'm focused on this thermal, I'm focused on coring up. All my energy is going into this very small point in space, which I'm in, which is probably a good thing because if you don't find that, you're going to land out. But a lot of energy while we're thermaling gets sucked into the cockpit in our small space and it takes away from the greater good of what's happening, who's coming into our thermal heat, who sees us and is coming in low. We lose a lot of that data um, by zooming in our clear nav. We lose who's around us. We're probably not looking out as, outside as much as we need to, especially in the first two or three turns where we're really trying to core it. We're focused on our flight and not so much everyone else's. And so by zooming in the clear nav, you can really lose a lot of information there. So if you run two units, whether it be a round one and a square one, run just one, or you switch to the overhead map and you just want to look at the dots, often switching to the map is better than zooming in on the clear nav. Here's a little video on the thermal assist in action. Oops, just kidding. There we go. So we can zoom in and zoom out on our dots if we want to. But simply by clicking in or turning the, the left encoder to the right two clicks, I can either go to an enlarged thermal assist where I lose uh, the vario pointer, but the thermal assist is bigger, or we can go to that overhead thermal map and make our adjustments as needed. We got a question for, from the audience, Ben. Uh, the question is, what is what is that 10 degree advance of? Is it the peak of lift in that circle? Yes. So the arrow is pointed to the peak of lift and the 10 degree advance is how long we're going to alarm prior to arriving at the peak. So if I set it to 30 degrees, it's going to alarm me 30 degrees from the peak. So you don't really want to you don't want to be leveling out right at the arrow in line parallel to the arrow because then you're behind it. So that 10 degree gives me a little bit of heads up that I'm gonna make my adjustment and gives me a little bit of time to answer the question. I flew it, I flew it at 30 seconds and it seemed too, uh, or sorry, 30 degrees and it seemed too far. Uh, 10 degrees seems a little late if you're not right on top of it. So it just depends on how long you wanna be alerted. And you hear that little chime, you look down, you take your two seconds in the cockpit, look, yes, that's what I wanna do. And you make your adjustment. And you should be doing that based on what's outside and what it feels like anyway, but it just helps in there. That's all the questions so far, Ben. Cool. Two more slides. So another neat feature. So how do I fix this problem? What's the problem, Ben? Um, some guy in front of me was flying along and tossed a bag out. No. Um, so sometimes things fly out of the cockpit, i.e. a bag, um, and occasionally they impale on our nice impaling device in the back. So we happen to be flying along the uh, Marble Mountains, run along, it was a great day. I uh, needed to uh, have a little pilot relief. And then when I went to go dislodge this from the glider, it got stuck to the wing and then sucked off the wing and landed on the total energy probe. And there's actually been two times um, that this feature in the clear nav has helped. So when you plug in your clear nav, you can run it using your uh, static ports your, and your total energy port, or you can turn off the uh, total energy compensation coming from the very. You can turn off the port and only have it electrically compensated, which works just fine but it's a feature, it's under your Vario settings and you can turn on and off the electronic compensation or turn the electron, yeah, the TE compensation off. So we we're flying along and that thing got stuck. I was looking at this bag flapping around and the Vario was going bonkers. And Dennis was like, what's wrong? I'm like, I don't know, he must've hit something. And uh, so I reached up, switched it over and the Vario went back to normal. I turned off the, the port there and it was working fine. 
it actually saved Dave McMaster's last year for a day in the junior worlds as well. They had a rainy day. He forgot to take the port or he took the total energy port off and it dumped and he got a bunch of water in the line back there. Didn't think, didn't think anything of it. And he got up flying and his barrier was all out of whack. And he remembered that I told him about this when we were flying, I'm like, Hey, you can turn this thing off if you need to, you might not need to. And he remembered that in the worlds and was able to go in there, switch it off and get the barrier to still work for him all day. And when all his, all his other instruments were all whacked out, but his very worked. And he actually, I think he came in eighth or ninth that day. Um, but it almost ruined his day. And being able to turn that off real quick is a, is a neat feature you can use. And with that, that's, uh, that's all I got for computers and variometers. Um, if you're out looking for more information on any of this stuff, um, the, on the ClearNav computers, the variometer, um, uh, William Soaring Center has started a YouTube channel that has some videos. That's where this will be posted. That's where links to past webinars are, um, Pete's talks, Kempton's talks. Um, any, any talks we've been recording on Zoom or recorded, we're putting up on online on the William Soaring YouTube channel. You can subscribe to that channel or, or just go view those videos. Hopefully in the next two or three weeks before the convention, there will be a new ClearNav website uh, launching here shortly, as long as I finish what I'm supposed to. And <laughs> uh, that'll be a new resource to go get the manuals. We're making the manuals PDF. It'll have links to all the videos and uh, anything else you need, um, as well as you know, coming in, we have the 32, all the K21s have all the ClearNav systems. So if you need more work with the computer, you can do it there. Like I said before, the simulator is working um, for Condor that has the ClearNav. So you can run that with the tasks and run that through to understand the computer a little bit more. Um, and remember the cardinal rule of computers. If you put garbage in, you're gonna get garbage out. So you really, really need to know your computer system, what you're setting and what you're using every single flight because it'll come and uh, it can it can come back and bite you if you don't. So that's all I got. Any questions from anybody? They're in awe still. Ginny said, thanks. November 9th says, thanks. Thanks you guys for coming. And I'm going to bid you adieu, Ben. All right. Well, thanks, Pete. You're welcome. And thanks, everyone, for uh, logging in. We had a lot of fun. Hopefully, that was useful. Thank you, Ben. That was great. I, I've got the round, the 57 millimeter round display. I've got so much to learn on it. So I'm sure I'll be talking to you more in the future. Yeah, stuff uh, that I wasn't even aware of. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad. And yeah, like I said, there's there's a there's a couple of those videos out there. But anytime you want to talk about anything before before the flight, after the flight, I can help you out with it. So. Appreciate it. Thanks. Absolutely. Hey, thanks, Ben. Hope to see you soon out there. Yeah. Good to see you. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Ben. Nice job. Thanks, Pete. Have a nice dinner. Yeah, will do.